Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're gonna be restoring this vintage Bianchi road bike. Let's get started. The very first thing I'm gonna be doing with this bike is just cleaning it. I'm not going to be restoring this frame or repainting it or anything like that. I'm just going to, first of all, I'm just gonna clean it. That'll give me a good chance to take a look at all the details. I do already know there's a pretty good sized dent here. There's a lot of little surface rusts, but um, I'm just gonna clean it. It'll give me a chance to kind of familiarize with myself with the bike. And then after that, we'll strip it down and get all the components off of it. And I'll be using this uh, 409 multi-surface cleaner today. So I don't know a ton about this bike yet. Best I can tell is this is a early 2000s. So it's not like what you'd think of as super vintage. And usually when I think of early 2000s, I think aluminum, but this is in fact a steel, a steel frame bike, which I think is very cool. I like steel framed. And it is Reynolds 520 steel, butted tubes, butted and dented already. Thank you very much. So I did see on the Bike Farmer channel, which if you haven't seen it, whoops, you should check it out. It's, he's actually like a real bike mechanic. And uh, he had recommended using like a furniture polish or furniture, yeah, polish uh, on the bike frame when you're done. So I'll probably try that out. I've never tried it before, never even thought about doing that. Uh, not gonna do that now, of course, but uh, when we get this thing finished. For now, what I'm thinking about, and you may have seen my other quick intro video I did with my phone. Now I'm thinking about like, what, what am I gonna use for a rust inhibitor? I know they sell some stuff that you can spray on or apply to any kind of rust and it'll kind of, I guess the idea is neutralize it. I've used it before actually. I think it's different brands and different products, but essentially it will kind of turn the rust black. And uh, the idea is that it won't continue rusting. I think it, the time I used it was on a car and I think it eventually did actually, oops, sorry about that guys. I just whack my lens. Uh, I think eventually it did start rusting again actually, but it does slow it, slow the process down. And when I say eventually, I mean like over a matter of 10 years, it kind of wore off so to speak. Anyway, I'm not going to try to clean it super good now because I'm going to take all the components off and I'll be able to uh, clean it up better. Um, I mentioned it in the other video. I'm going to take a closer look right now is this doesn't seem to be perfectly round tubing and I don't, I hope, I hope that it's supposed to be not perfectly round and it's not like extremely bent, but basically it feels like it's an oval in that direction. So I'm going to take this off, mount it up here somewhere else. I'll take a closer look at the, the roundness of this down tube. Right. I'm not sure if you can really tell, but uh, these, this tube is definitely, it's not a perfect circular tube. And I think it's the way it's supposed to be because it's just too symmetrical and I don't see like any big impacts around here. There is a dent up here, up here, but I don't think that that would have caused that. So I think we're okay. I think it's just a fancy tubing they did, which actually does kind of look cool. A little bit different than what you would see on a very old frame. And like I said before, this isn't that old of a frame in my opinion anyway. You know, it's an early 2000s. To me, that's kind of still modern in a way. Anyway, I think I'm pretty much done for the evening. I'm going to go ahead and next pull off all the components, then clean the frame really good. The good thing is too, I don't see and feel any rust down here inside the seat tube. Not really. So I think it might be in pretty good shape. Okay, next up, I think I'm going to go ahead and just disassemble everything off of this frame. Let's start off with these pedals. Oh, add a little bit of this, uh, whatever it's called, blaster. So the side with the drive, drive side, is going to be the normal lefty-loosey as you face the crank. So it should go like this. Okay. Yes. Not sure what to do with these old, old pedals. I, I never use these myself. I don't know if anybody's buying these.
I was just thinking that I shouldn't probably have the frame gripped by this area where the decal is because as the frame kind of twists and turns, it could be scratching up and peeling up the decal even more. So I'm going to re-grab it somewhere else where there's no decals. There weren't really that many places to grab it without decals, but they, I did find this little area uh, on the top tube, so. Okay, so next, let's go ahead and cut some of these cables. I don't have a proper bike-specific cable cutter, which I would like to get, uh, but I, the Capri Tool Company did send me some tools, and one of them was a cable cutter, so it actually works really well. It's very sharp. See? Obviously, we're not going to reuse these cables. A little bit unusual that it has a nut here instead of an Allen bolt. Nine millimeter. There we go. Now I'm going to try not to lose these pieces here, of course. So I'll use my most favorite tool of them all, the AWS Dash One, which is a, what is it, six, five, and a four, yeah, four, five, six millimeter hex combo. It's not always the most handy thing because it's kind of big and gets in the way, but for a lot of things, it's just handy. Okay, there's our Sora derailleur in all its glory. I was able to rotate the frame uh, easily thanks to this Park Tools PCS 9.2 bike stand. I love having good tools. I didn't always have this bike stand. In fact, you can look at one of my older videos where I had a like a cheap $50 Amazon bike stand bike work stand and uh, started off okay, but it got worn out and got worse and worse and worse until it was just terrible. So I bought, bit the bullet and bought a nice tool, which I should have done to begin with. Here you can see what I mean when I was saying that I rotated the, the frame, I was simply able to loosen this up and rotate the frame so I could have perfect access to the uh, brake caliper, which I've now removed. Also helps for filming because you can, get, you can get it nicer angles. So now let's go ahead and take off this seat clamp. Don't know if I'll reuse this or not. Probably not, because on such a bike, you don't need to be changing your seat height very often. And this is a bit complicated and heavy. Next, I'd like to get the bike just a hair bit higher so I can get at the bottom bracket area. So let's see if this can go up a little bit higher. Here we go. Got another three or four inches higher. That's nice. And once again, I'll use my Capri Tools wire clipper just to get that out of the way. One thing I would like is uh, one of those bibs that I can stick my tools in. Like I see Bike Farmer and some of the other guys have. That would be nice. Okay, maybe one day. All right, let's just get this old piece of cable out of here. And now let's free the Sora derailleur. Oh, that was pretty loose, interesting. These are a little bit particular because they have to be able to fit around your seat tube. And there are different size seat tubes, so there's different size de front derailleur clamps. I have used a spacer before, and that worked pretty good. Now let's go ahead and get this big guy off. Uh, that is something my AWS Dash 1 cannot support as this, I believe, is an eight millimeter and we only have up to six here. I don't remember if I mentioned it on a previous video, but I'm in a new garage again. Yes, I move, I've been moving a lot in the past several years, but uh, this is another rental house. 
so I can't do absolutely everything I would like to do in this garage, but I am so happy to be in a workshop again because the house I lived in for the last year, which is a house I own, uh, it doesn't have a garage um, at all, or even a work shed or anything. So uh, you might have seen some of my videos were done in the backyard, which I really hate working in the backyard. It's uh, such a hassle. It's such a hassle um, setting everything up, getting all the tools out, getting the bike stand out, all this. To, to finally even get to start start working. Um, let me put some of that degreaser on here. And then you have uh, sometimes bad lighting for the camera. Sometimes it starts raining, mosquitoes. It's just, uh, it's tough working just outside. I had even bought like one of those triangle tarps that you kind of can hang up, but I never used it. I was thinking maybe I would do that. But I was like, not exactly depressed, but getting close to being depressed about not being able to work on things the way I like. Oh my God. Speaking of depressed, I just screwed that up. Wow. I have never done that before, but I just did it. There's a first for everything. I did not have that th threaded in enough. And look at that. I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, and I, I'll show you the truth, the truth of what I did. Wow, look at that. I just ripped those out. It wasn't threaded in far enough, I guess, obviously. Oh, man. I hope I can recover from that. Wowzers, that was screwed up. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's uh, stop rambling and pay attention to what I'm doing here. It's the thing is, is it's like the threads aren't super smooth so I, I just gave up prematurely <laughs> so uh, yeah not good I think it's gonna be okay I think I think I think I just need to get this threaded in a little deeper I feel like they're they're tracking correctly right now that feels okay that feels good it's not too bad. It doesn't feel cross-threaded. This time I'm gonna make sure I get it in there far enough. <laughs> All right, that's, that's good. All right, I think we're okay. Whew. That was scary, I've never done that. I've never seen that happen. All right, I think we're good now. That's better. That's the way it's supposed to be. You know what? I'm gonna hang this up on here just to hold it for a second so I can pop this back off. Anyway, as I was saying, I was getting kind of depressed not being able to work on things in a garage. And obviously this channel is all about bike stuff, but I also like to do woodworking. I just like to, I just like to make things and fix things. Uh, I work um, in an office full time on the computers, so to be able to do something with my hands is quite a pleasure. All right, now just for fun, I'm gonna clean this area off a little bit. A lot of rubbing down here. Not sure what happened. Somebody had the wrong size wheel or or the wheel got bent or something. Wow. So pretty. I think this is a beautiful frame. Anyway, as I'm trying to say, I think at this time, you know, 2001, they really didn't make many steel road bikes. So this wouldn't have been like a high-end racing bike. But what I could imagine. Oh, that's very tight. Whoa. Hmm. What I could imagine happened is they thought, well, we have all this extra 
steel tubes, why don't we make a bike, a lower end bike that we can sell for cheap and just get rid of all this old tubing. So they did that, they threw on some cheap components. Yep. Okay, this side's coming off a little easier, more easily. So yeah, they probably thought, hey, we have some cheap components, we can make a, a low priced road bike. And uh, some of the older folks may see it and like the way it looks with its steel components, steel tubes, that is. When I did some searching, online for this exact bike. I really didn't find very much at all. So I'm guessing it wasn't that popular, which to me isn't surprising because during the time of aluminum bikes, why would you want to buy a steel frame? I imagine in 2001 this would have seemed pretty outdated, wouldn't it? That's kind of an odd thing, the uh, rear brake cable or yeah, brake cable or shifter cable is going underneath the fork. So I'm not sure if it was put together that way at some point, but that's definitely not good. It, I mean, yeah, it must be, it must be. It's the uh, shifter cable. Wow, that is pretty weird. The right shifter cable was mounted, or routed rather, underneath the fork. I wonder if that would shift at all. I mean, it's quite a sharp bind, and every time you turn, it's gonna mess with it. Wow, that's pretty bad. So, let's see if we can get that off of there. There we go. Oh, that's not good. Get this uh, Sora shifter off. I've never actually had one quite like this, so uh, there you go. I guess up up to the bigger, that's gonna be pushing you to the bigger ones, and then it has a, see if I can show you. It's quicker here to go down. All right, let's go ahead and get these old brake levers off. I'm not sure if I'll reuse them or not. I'm not even sure, I can't really quite see if this was an eight speed or a seven speed, probably an eight speed. I don't have the wheels that came with it. It took me a little bit to figure out how to get these shifters and brake levers off, but I'm pretty sure the clamp mechanism has a bolt that you access through here. Uh, I did stick this one in a second ago, but I'm not sure if I'm not getting it right or if it's a, I feel like this might be too small. I'm gonna go, this is a four, let's go up to a five millimeter. And by the way, this uh, brake and shifter system seems to have like an electro, okay, that's it, perfect. Seem to have uh, an electronic component to them. And I've actually have that on another set of levers I have, and I don't know what it's for, like what you do with it. I think it says something about flight deck, maybe? So if anybody out there watching knows what that's about, let me know in the comments. Okay, there it goes. I'm using a little extra leverage here. Okay. Yep, there we go. There's actually a button right there. So apparently the rider can press the button and I have no idea what it's supposed to do. <laughs> um, and if you pull this back, you can see there's some kind of, it seems like there would be a button underneath that, which would be right around here, but I don't see really any button. So maybe that was an option that this one didn't have, I'm not sure, but there are some screws here where it looks like maybe there's some electronics or some kind of battery you could change out. I really am clueless here, so. Please do let us know if you're aware about this uh, this button. It's on both. It was on both sides too. So, so I think you should be able to determine how many uh, gears this will shift 
just by shifting it, of course, and it should be, I guess, one less than the amount that it can handle. So let's try it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So that means it's an eight speed. That means this is an eight speed shifter. Okay. Which is kind of cool. I actually like eight speed. I have eight speed on my co-op bike. And I have eight speed on my Gary Fisher. I used to be, I used to be more of a nine speed guy, but now I think I'm becoming an eight speed guy. I guess I'm getting older and, and, um, yeah. Anyway, that looks pretty. What doesn't look so pretty, in my opinion, is that stem. It looks kind of weird. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Should I keep that stem? It does say Bianchi on it, which is cool, but it looks quite chunky. And I may have some cooler looking stems, so I'm not sure about keeping that. I'm not sure about keeping these bars either. I mean, there's nothing special about these, and I have a ton of bars. Well, maybe not a ton, but I probably have five or six different bars, so no shortage there. Anyway, enough rambling. Let's go ahead and get the fork and the bars off. Ooh, that was pretty loose. Wow, that was too loose. Wow, that came out way easier than it should have. Well, who knows, maybe somebody else was working on it. So to get your forks off your old quill stem bike like this, usually you need a couple very big wrenches. This is a specialty one, of course, and this is obviously just a, an adjustable. So the bottom one I think is the larger. I don't know the exact size. I think it may not be metric. I think that maybe uh, it says 32 36 <laughs> strange fraction. Maybe it is a metric size. Let me know in the comments. I, am, I don't know. So then the top one's slightly smaller, so you can just use your adjustable wrench on that. Okay, that came pretty easy. So basically it's a, it's a compression and lock system. So this one's gonna compress the bearings and then this one will, you know, thread right into that one, thus locking the whole thing. It's a nice, a nice system, I think. I actually like quill stems. I know they're heavier and, you know, basically obsolete almost. That is very dry. Um, I know they're pretty much obsolete, but you know, there's a washer here too. Um, but I like them. They're easy to work on. Not that, not that the other, other kind isn't, but I don't know. I just like them. It's easy to raise and lower your handlebar. That's the big advantage. Bad part is sometimes the parts do get seized. Sometimes the, uh, the quill can get seized in the steer tube, fork tube, fork tube. I'm not sure what, what to call it. All right, what is going to be the condition of these bearings? Probably, most likely, the bearings themselves will be fine. They just may be dirty or not as greased as much as they should. Rarely have I had bearings that are just totally toast. Although it has happened. Let's see, what do we got? Okay, nothing. Okay. Oh, these are sealed bearings. Okay, that's cool. So the, <laughs> these are not, uh, uh huh. And because of that, I may not want to um, try to take them out. Because basically, if it's a sealed bearing, like that whole sealed cartridge will be kind of press fitted into there. And it can be a little bit of a bear to get out without bending it and breaking it and, uh, having to buy a new one. Um, it's basically almost dry, so. So it's good that I got into it, but <clears throat> yeah. Kind of wasn't expecting to see this, but I guess it makes sense. It's a, it's a bit of a newer bike and it is, I mean, like I said, like I was saying, it wasn't like a high end, but it wasn't uh, you know, it's not a department store bike either. So uh, most of these vintage steel bikes that I deal with, they have loose 
bearings here at this stage, um, which is what, what I was a little bit more expecting. Uh, but being it is a decent bike from the uh, early 2000s, they, I guess they decided to go with a cartridge style. Okay, that's cool. We can we can work with that. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, yeah, get some kind of degreaser and just like try to get clean it out as much as I can. And obviously the grease itself isn't the problem. The, the any kind of dirt or debris is the actual problem. So I will do my best to clean it and regrease it. A couple rack mounts here I just noticed. So let's go ahead and pull those out. I mean, not that I need to really at all since I'm not going to paint, but just for can, just to, I don't know, just to take it down as far as I can. I'm also going to weigh the frame now, being that the front bearings are going to stay and the front cups and stuff are going to stay. Uh, the weight won't be perfectly accurate, but it'll be close enough and we could, if you, if we want, we can estimate the weight of those to get a final weight. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this uh, bottom bracket off of here. Bottom bracket bearing set. Um, now, it's quite tight. And what I've learned is when things get kind of tight and difficult, that is the time that you need to be more patient. <laughs> so that's the time that you don't want to go crazy uh, just being really rough with things because these frames can as I know, as you may know from my other video, can be damaged pretty easily, actually. So what I'm doing now is I'm bringing it down to the ground where I'm gonna work on it. <clears throat> so I have a solid connection. Because the thing is, if I have that in the, in the stand and, I, and I'm really cr cramping, uh, pushing down, it's actually putting a lot of uh, torque on this top tube, which is butted, so it's thin. And I don't want any chance of bending that or anything like that. So I'm thinking the best thing to do would be actually put this on the ground or to have more of like a solid multi-point pressure load and trying it like that. So let's give that a shot. Get that a little bit out of the way. I'm gonna put my foot across here gently, not too hard. I'm gonna stick that like that. does not want to come. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the Capri Tool Company also sent me this gigantic breaker bar. I don't know how big this is. It's longer than my arm. So I think, I think this ought to, I think this ought to work. I'm using actually a bike stand uh, that I made a long time ago to try to stabilize everything. Okay, something's happening. There it goes. All you need is a little leverage. The inside of this bottom bracket shell is very rusty, I think, uh, but I'm not really sure. I mean, it's obviously some kind of rust. Look how orange it is, but it feels almost like a clay, which is pretty weird. Yuck. Look at that. Okay, it's a little bit hard to see, but there is a decent amount of rust in there, actually. I don't know if it's coming out on camera or not. I feel like we're not getting a, a great shot, but 
There you go. You can see it right there. There is a good amount of rust actually in there. So it's a good thing that I took this bottom bracket out and that I'm going to do a rust preventative measure. So I think what we were seeing all that orange stuff in there was a combination of, of uh, rust and just grime. So um, yeah, I actually am going with linseed oil. It's not that I think it's better, but it's what I could get my hands on in short notice. And it's quite cheap. It was like $8 at Walmart. And a lot of people recommend boiled linseed oil as a, as a rust preventative on the inside of on the inside of your frame. So we're actually going to do that today because we're pretty much done now. Right, as I was saying, we're pretty much done now with the frame. I mean, taking it down, the only thing left that it has, literally, is the head tube cups and the bearings, which I'm going to leave because I just don't see any reason to remove them. I got this scale a long time ago on Alibaba or something like that, eBay, for very cheap, and it's, uh, it's accurate enough. It's actually a luggage scale, if you're curious. I probably paid less than $10 for it. Okay. One point nine five kilograms, so that means one thousand nine hundred grams, I think. If you want that in pounds, that's four point three pounds. Again, one ninety five kilos, one point nine five kilograms, one thousand nine hundred grams. Yeah, of course, one thousand nine hundred grams. So you can take a few off for the headset. Now I did read a little bit about Reynolds five twenty which is what this frame is, Reynolds 520. So apparently the 520 is the same thing as the uh, 525, I guess it is. Not sure if I'm remembering that right. But that indicates that it was made in Taiwan. So I guess that's like the Taiwanese version, but in terms of the tube itself and the material, it's exactly the same. So, a little bit more about it, I, I learned. I learned that it's a great tubing for all around per, uh, balance of performance and durability. It's not the lightest. I guess that would be like a Reynolds 900 series, like 965 or something like that, uh, which will be mega, not mega, but super light, but also thinner and a little bit more delicate. So, I think this is a, a, a really nice material, probably. Anyway. Now that we have it totally taken down, we're going to do the, the frame saver stuff. Now, I've never done this before. I've heard it's a bit messy, and I've heard, I've heard that it's good if you use a syringe, which luckily I have a syringe, so. Because we recently moved, I have a whole bunch of cardboard, so I'm using that to help protect the floor. And also, I'm going to use this duct tape to per, uh, cover up all the holes so hopefully it doesn't just, you know, come pouring everywhere at once. Surely it'll leak some, but I'm not worried about that. There's a lot of holes, of course, in the frame. But I want to keep most of it in so I can kind of slosh it around and, and uh, so it'll reach as many places as possible. And I've heard you should use gloves when handling this, so let me get some gloves on. Okay, these are some vinyl gloves. I, I just had a whole, I actually have a whole bunch of these. You know, I didn't, I didn't notice if it said you need to shake this or not, so I'll shake it a little bit. Get it mixed around. Okay. Let me get a rag ready. All right, I am going to go ahead and take out, let's go with 50 milliliters, 50 cc's, okay. Okay, close enough. Throw that cap back on. 
set that out of the way. Wow, that's annoying. I just realized I didn't, I forgot to press record while I injected the oil into the frame. It wasn't a lot to see. I probably look pretty stupid, I'll just tell you that much. But I uh, injected the oil into all the areas that I thought I could, into any of the holes. I spun the frame a few times around. Now, at this point, all the oil is is in the frame, or most of it's actually probably on the ground right now. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do some spin cycles <laughs> with it, just to try to get the oil everywhere inside the frame that I can. I certainly have it well covered on the inside of the bottom bracket, so that gives me hope that the rest of the frame tubes have it covering them as well. Now I could even, I could have probably injected some right into these holes here, but I didn't think to do that. But I really think it looks like when I look down, everything looks very wet now. So I think I got everything pretty good. Just, <laughs> just spinning it around trying to, trying to give it a chance to be everywhere. Like I had said before when I wasn't recording, I guess, is that this is the first time I've ever done this, so I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sure people who know about this are probably laughing right now, but there you go. This is, this is reality. All right. Now what I want to do is actually clean the outside of the frame because I don't really think, I don't know, but it, I got quite a bit of it accidentally on the, on the frame itself. So. Now I'm going to get rid of my cardboard mess and clean up everything and then I'm going to just clean the frame with some general purpose degreaser. Not degreaser, but general purpose cleaner. Oh look at that, some rust chunks have fallen down during this process. Look at that, wow, gross. I guess the first thing I should really do, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to trash this old rag. I don't know what's on it. I'm going to get a fresh rag. And I'm just gonna wipe the whole bike down because it's still dripping. What an oily mess. I wonder how people do this without getting the outside of the frame um, covered in the same oil. Because I'm pretty sure this whole entire frame is now outside and inside covered in boiled linseed oil. Okay, good news, the thin latex gloves did protect my hands just fine. They are totally dry when I took my gloves off. I actually left the cardboard and put a rag down here because it's still dripping a little bit. And speaking of rags, like everywhere I read, they say that you should not, if you get this stuff on a rag, you can't leave it like, I don't know, bundled up or something in a trash can because it can, can, it can apparently spontaneously combust. So, that's not good. Okay, now I'm just gonna try to clean the outside of the frame up with just some 409. Just to get that linseed oil off of the outside of the frame. I don't think it'll hurt the paint, but I'm not totally sure, so. Just going to clean it up on the outside. 